Welcome to God of Hope. This is Will Sanchez. Thank you for tuning in. My special guest today is Jack Cole. He is a writer, pianist, and a runner. He is a former president of the Northport Running Club. And we're going to talk about his book about running, a novel, a psychological thriller that I'm halfway through called Loco Motive. I'm honored to have Jack as a guest. Thank you, Will. I'm equally honored to be here. Jack, before we go into the, into the book, um, I think the way we discovered each other, because I mentioned the Northport Running Club, mm -hmm. and that's Kathy Martin's yes. haunting grounds. Yes. Is that how uh, you made the connection? That is how I made the connection. I had watched the episode with Kathy Martin, and I've had the honor of watching Kathy's amazing progress had the honor of trying to imagine I can even keep up with Kathy. I remember running in the visiting nurse service race, which is in Northport Village every May. Uh -huh. And when I was a real zealot, high mileage person, fancying that in any way I might be able to keep up with her for a brief moment in the beginning, and then of course, being taught the truth. We're all brought down to, uh, yes. to earth. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But I was very interested in uh, how my my wife always asks me what she sees I guess, well, how do you know him? Yes. Uh -huh. And I said, I, I get around. Mm -hmm, you do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. But let's uh, introduce you to our audience. Sure. Tell us where you were born and tell us something about your growing up years. I was born in New York City here on Manhattan Island in 1970. And then my family moved out to Long Island. And I took to it like no other place that I could have been taken to. It became my native place, and I still fight to remain there because not only do I love it for my own sense of past and sentiment, but I feel it projects a mythic image of place that is slighted in the media all the time. Usually it's a parody place of people okay. with funny accents and Amy Fisher tragedies and Levittown sprawls, uh -huh. but there are enclaves and beautiful scenes and beautiful scenery and landscapes and stories that I don't think are often told. It's a far richer place than I think most people ever give it credit for. I, I think you're absolutely correct. Now, as a child growing up, I guess mostly in Long Island, yes. were you athletically involved? I played soccer. And growing up in Northport Village, the Great Cow Harbor 10K was always an activity that I saw from afar and I would watch it, and yet, no part of me imagined, for whatever reason, participating when I was a child. It just seemed like a grand thing that happened. I had no idea that, in a way, it just took an act of the will simply to want to participate. And we were talking earlier about being late bloomers to running. And I was a relatively late bloomer. I wasn't 30 before I started. And I was away in graduate school. And only when I was done with graduate school and had many reasons that I really should be Sure, I was compelled to run that upon returning to Northport, there it was, as if waiting all that time. Not only the Great Cal Harbor 10K, but the Northport Running Club. But as a child, somehow you discovered the piano because you're a professional pianist. Yes. So tell us, how did you discover the piano? The piano was part of a deal with my mother. We had a piano from my grandparents, and I didn't want to take the piano, but my mother said, that I could take horseback riding lessons, which I had asked for if I studied the piano. And after starting the piano, I never asked for the horseback riding lessons again. So what running there was going to be wasn't going to be the horse's responsibility. It was going to be mine later on in life. And the piano, in a way, is what brought me to running. Because I studied the piano so much and became a zealot practicer from about 14 to age 30. I went as an undergraduate and master's and doctor studies in the piano. And of course, the piano is a lifetime of sitting. And it's active, but when I was in graduate school, around 2, 3 o'clock, I always fancied myself a, a fit person, a thin person. And however, in my late 20s, around 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I would need a pick-me-up. And I thought, well, maybe I should get some sweet iced tea or, or soda, or just go to the vending machine in the practice room hallways. And suddenly, I looked in the mirror one day, as what I thought was this dashing pianist, and I noticed this tubby fellow that I didn't recognize. 
I had a good friend in graduate school. His name is Dave Edgington, and he's a guitarist. And to his credit, around two or three o'clock in the afternoon, when I would go looking to see when I needed a little pause from the practicing who was around still, where my friend Dave was, and his room would be empty. And I'd ask, well, where's Dave? And people would say he was running. So one day, I put on a pair of beat-up tennis shoes, and this was in South Carolina, and I don't do very well in the heat, and it might have been 100 degrees and very humid. And I put on a cotton t-shirt, everything that we runners eventually eschew, knowing that those things are challenging right, right. to wear. And I went out, and I don't think I could have made it more than a few blocks. And I was drenched, and I sat down in front of a public school, and I noted children looking at me as if I was almost as if an old man to them. They couldn't move. And what amazed me, in my experience of running, I've never been able to proselytize or to recruit someone into running. Runners, for me, for the most part, seem to suddenly be born out of some impulse within uh -huh. themselves. And that's what happened to me. I don't know why, except for seeing my friend as a runner, I didn't have many other inspirations to do it. Uh -huh. And I thought after that first run, I would have had every inspiration to stop uh -huh. because I could hardly uh -huh. right. walk. I was so sore. I, I, I was comprehensively sore I, everywhere. And I even think I seized up. I don't know what the actual event is mm -hmm. that I experienced, but I had to sit down. I couldn't move. I masked that experience in the novel okay. for the narrator or the first person narrator talking about his first experience as a runner. And yet, the day after that, I felt the impulse to run again. Interesting. And when I was done with graduate school in South Carolina, my mother had mentioned, who was still in Northport, that she noticed people with Northport running club jackets. And one thing led to another, and I went and began to do not only love running as a group activity, because I had fancied it as a solitary thing, and uh -huh. the piano was a very solitary yeah, yeah. thing, and so was running, and so was writing. And yet, I started to realize how valuable it is as a group activity. You maintain your solitude, and yet somehow one prospers. And I must say, it's the one activity in which I've never experienced jealousy or anger. Most people are incredibly supportive in running. Yes, yes. So when it occurred to me to write something of a thriller and a mystery, or a murder mystery, if you will, I had to import into it certain mythic elements that I wasn't finding in the actual culture. Okay. Of it. So it had to be intensely deep psychic, if not psychotic, okay. issues that I thought no one had covered in a novel like this. You were talking about Locomotive, Locomotive, your second novel. Yes, and of course the title is meant, even by its hyphen hyphenation, to suggest that the characters may have a mad motive for uh -huh. what's going on. And also the title, I didn't originally hyphenate it. I originally just had it as Locomotive because the title was also equally referencing Superman lore. Right, right. The uh, faster than a speeding bullet, right, more right. powerful than a locomotive. That's right. And the book also, for anyone who loves Superman lore, would know that there's a latent tracking of the tragedy of Krypton ah. and the notion of surviving yes. sons who may be of some service somewhere else yes, yes. and whether or not we can transfer that myth to our own planet. Yes and to explore that amongst other possible mad motives ah, in the midst of ah. a very recognizable modern running culture. Right, right. Well, as I mentioned in my opening monologue, I've, I've gone through half the book. Mm. And it reminded me, honestly, my days of high school, meaning this is not a quick read. Yes. Most if anybody reads nowadays, it's usually mm -hmm. something that's really quick. You can pick it up mm -hmm. and finish it off in a couple of days yes. or a weekend. But this one took me ages just to get past the first 20 pages. This is not going to be a quick read. Uh -huh. And then when I hit chapter two, mm. I noticed it picked up. For me, okay, mm -hmm. this is picking up the pace. Mm -hmm. and, and like a high school, I had a, had a pad of paper besides my thing because I, had, I saw a few words. I said, well, I've got to write that down because I had no idea what that meant. Okay. Uh, and I saw a few phrases that I loved. Well, I thank thought, you. Vindictive speed, mm. because it's a running book. And I said, well, that's a phrase I haven't used in my conversation. Sure. Well, that guy has vindictive speed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, it's, but it obviously means okay. something else. Sure. When you wrote this book, obviously it's a few years ago. Yes. It was novel number two. Mm -hmm. um, what inspired you to write this book? Well, I'll mention some of the more elevated mythic things that you're alluding to. But it started out 
where I felt I was noticing things about running culture that I don't know that anyone else had addressed from a simple mystery or murder mystery possibility. One was the notion of the vulnerability, and I hope I don't put any terrible ideas in anyone's head, of the great trust that we put in water stops. That we run through strange places, we all travel across the country to run races, and of course it's one of the glories of the humanity of running that a stranger is making your run easier by handing you water in the desert. However, I don't think almost any of us questions who that is who's handing us the water. So one possible element of the thriller that I thought I wanted to start with in terms of the superficial notion of telling a, a possible spooky, scary, threatening story uh -huh. was the threat of the water stop that most people don't oh, consider. I just haven't gotten to that point. I don't okay. even have to start. Okay, so that's that's right. the second half. Huh? That's in there. And another was the fascinating potential that I thought that in a, amidst a race, and I don't know the exact rules all the time, but we all presume the winner is the person who crosses the finish line first. Of course, now in chip timing culture, we can learn that that may not be the case. And I thought a fable that also examines uh, the intense mystery of why this happens, that two men break the world record in the 10 kilometer race distance, and they don't cross the line first. It only is discovered later when the chip timing is determined. Because of course, as we all know, if one tr crosses the mat, even after almost everyone else is gone, and yet they're still permitting people to start the race, you could win and no one would know. Interesting. So I thought that was another thing that was important to examine in terms of, of the fable. And then to proceed in terms of the more psychological elements. I don't know, Will, if you feel this, but we all welcome the encouragement we get from the sidelines and from people who coach us. But I don't know if you feel this. Oftentimes when I'm giving all I can, and someone is encouraging me with all of the proverbial things like you can do it and you can give more. I know I'm giving all I can. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to explore the notion if there could be two runners of almost supernatural ability. And to me, the greatest threat is when someone's asking you, almost like a parent who's asking you to do more than you can, and yet to explore the threat of faith in someone else being an expectation that is so high, you almost don't want that encouragement. Mm -hmm. And I thought if you had two people who broke the world record, and one of them has a mad motive for seeing the other realize his potential beyond anything other any human being would want to ever experience, mm -hmm. the most dreadful thing is to have someone have that faith in you if you don't want to realize it yourself. Mm. And I thought athletics, like running are usually such a warm environment, as I said, most people, I've never had a bad experience in running. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've never gone into running and been able to maintain an irritation or an anger or a resentment. It's usually vanquished by the end of a run. Mm -hmm. So I thought, what would be the one terror that one could have, even if you were really great at running? Uh -huh. And that would be that someone knows that you have potential beyond that which you are capable of, yeah. but you know that that might either kill you because what you're being asked to do to break the world record uh -huh. is something that will cause you to expire. Yeah, that person who is offering that threat, the almost drell like hope, the father from Krypton, yeah, yeah. the hope for his son to serve humanity being yeah. so high, but the risk is so high that it's almost a threat to the self. Uh -huh. And we've all seen friends, I have had a few friends who experiment with seeing what would happen if they run hard enough to the blackout point, and we've seen that. And I thought, again, to explore it from a almost Promethean mythic level, what would happen if someone is fast enough to make sure that you run fast enough because they're on your heels. And his hope is not for himself, but to see the fastest runner realize his dream, not only for that person, but for humanity to make a point. And of course, the ultimate point is the, the mystery of the book, the mad motive, if you will. The loco. The loco, loco motive. Loco, meaning mad in this yes, case. Yes, exactly. Loco, Spanish for crazy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow, fascinating. Well, what's your take? You know, now, in today's time is the mythical sub two hour marathon. Yes. And you probably saw Nike breaking two project where they had this artificial pacers and the world's finest runners mm -hmm. on a racetrack. Yes. Flat with a big car with mm -hmm. a windshield. Yes. Did you see that? And he did make it. Yes. He gave it his all, but he was 26 seconds short. Wow. So that must have been 
deja vu, in some sense, for you. It is. Thank you, Will, because the other very, very strong element of the book is something that occurred to me more or less when I was a child, and I know that any physicist will tell me this is illogical, and yet a part of my literary mind or poetic mind says, well, it makes sense. Human beings continue to break world records all the time. And it leads one to ask, what is the ceiling? People continue to break a record. And I remember riding in the car with my father on the Long Island Expressway. And there was a day filled with traffic. And of course, it meant that the time that we were taking to get to our destination was very long. And then I said, well, you know, at night, if we travel this road and it's free and clear, it'll be half as long. If you could continue to break down your travel time, as silly as this sounds, would you eventually arrive before you left? <laughs> now you're getting it to science fiction. Exactly. It's like Asimov territory. Exactly. And that's where the Superman lore and the, the Asimovian notion of what you would do if your running powers allowed you, in essence, to travel through time and end before you started, what would you do with that power? And what would be the psychic and mythic responsibility? And if you have a locomotive, what almost Ahab like sense in terms of a Moby Dick like madness, what would you feel that your responsibility is with that power? Interesting. And that's addressing part two, I mean, the it is. second half. It is. Well, the, you know, now I gotta rush home and well, finish the second thank half. You, <laughs> because the book is set in a newspaper office, there are editorials from the editor of the book, who is one of the principal characters and one of the runners. Mr. And, Mr. Hare. Yes, and you asked about the names, and here's something I don't mind giving away. Um, you said that the one character was named Shell, and the other was Hare. And of course, it's an allusion to the tortoise and the hare, that we have the, the, the notion of one person being incredibly fast yes. and one being steady, and how those two archetypes work right, off of right, each right. other. But, but Mr. Hare, he's the one that's standing by watching the other character. The supernatural speedster. I mean, you described two of them. Yes. So uh, the other doctor, the other person, I believe, was Pocket. Yes. Interesting name, Pocket. Yes. The character of Pocket and Hare are the two principal people who, who break, break, the 10K. The break the 10K record. And one is the person who has the greatest potential humanly, but has already experienced a problem in his high school running days. That was uh, Pocket. Yes. As a sophomore, he collapsed. He collapsed. Even though he was running supernaturally at that time. Right, and everybody had these impressions of what he could do, perhaps if he continued with it, but that frightened him to such an extent what exercising that power did. And so part of the theme, as I mentioned before, of the book is what if someone discovers that you have that power and not only thinks it should be realized. So that's Mr. Hare, he discovers it. He that. discovers it because he's uh, all, almost as fast. He discovers, yes. well, not only should that person realize his potential, but perhaps that potential has some greater application for humanity and he's obliged to oh, run that fast. The way you describe it could be an episode of a thinking man's version of The Flash. Possibly, because yes, as I mentioned, Superman and comic book lore, if you will, I tried to unite that with my best effort because I was the president of the Northport Running Club for a long time. And I think, you, Will, you can tell me, I think as well as any other runner, we encounter archetypes in running. Golly, everywhere I go, if I go travel to, to a marathon somewhere I've never been, I almost feel like I recognize the people when I don't know them. Mm -hmm. There are people who fulfill certain traits mm -hmm. in running. And what a glory it was to be a member of the Northport Running Club because I got to study firsthand with, with real loving observation all the archetypes. And I don't think anyone will, one, in the club discover their personalities in there as a recognizable singular character. There mm -hmm. are archetypes that are mixed. Right. But without that experience in the club as its president and as a member now, I just continue on as a civilian member, I'm no longer the president of the club, I think any person who loves running culture will also enjoy the book from that point of view because yes. running culture is unique to itself. It is. So how long ago did you write the book? Uh, maybe about uh, a decade ago, and then it was revised maybe uh, a year or two ago. Oh, okay. It finally went into print. Okay. And I, I think it's self-published because I don't recognize, well, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, public, the, the book that is published on there is the same as the, as the, uh, the press company that's mentioned in the, uh, in the article. It is, which makes one wonder if that place exists. exists. And as Melville observes, 
no true places down on any map. Uh, so I think it's called Pocktog. It is Pocktog. And that's a mystical place, but obviously based on Long Island because it has well, that smell of it. It does. And of course, if you know Northport and the North Shore and you know Fort Salonga, if you look closely enough in the woods, a Pocktog is between them, I okay. assure you. Now let's talk about the cover. Mm. You have this winsome runner, mm. look like he's wearing a bra, doesn't look like any running top that I've seen uh -huh. on women, Yes, running in a cemetery. So what is the significance of the cover? Well, that is a setting from Long Island that I discovered on trail run adventures with a colleague of mine named Peter Klan, and we also have a, a small running club called the Unanswered Question Free Running Compact, and we do trail <laughs> runs and look for unusual settings, and we came across this setting when we were running. Cemetery. This cemetery, which is in Setauket. And without question, I recognize a setting I had already conceived in the completed book. In the book is a setting called the Sunken Cemetery. And here, lo and behold, was a colonial era cemetery right along the water. The photograph hardly needed any manipulation. There's some slight manipulation. And then the gal in the cover uh, is a model, Kelsey Fiona McGuire. She's an actress who was an usher when I was serving as a conductor at a, at a musical. Uh -huh. and she was the spitting image of one of the characters. So I needed a gal who suggested a very preoccupied fitness culture uh, woman. Okay. And the subtext of idealized beauty as espoused by woman is explored in the book a great deal. Yes, yes. Mrs. Hare. Yes. And also Pocket's sister right. and Dale Pocket. Dale, is right. his sister, right. and her physical beauty is so idealized she hardly even speaks. Ah, so how long did it take you from the moment you realized you had a book in you? Yes. Did the final, here it is. Who, who gets it? Well, this book, I almost never tell a living soul what any of my books are about. I feel like I'm letting out steam if I describe them out loud. This book I had to reveal to my mother and father and maybe a few other people because they were afraid the degree of involvement I was giving to running. It was as if it had completely taken over my life, and it can for a lot of runners. And that can be a benign obsession. And however, a lot of it was because I, golly, I was already pursuing running, and now I was running with you know, notepads in hand, and I was the, involved in the running club, so everything was fueling it. So I was already involved for several years in the running club, and then when I committed to the few notions that I told you that inspired the book, I would say maybe about a year's labor of keeping a journal in which anything that I thought was of significance to running that I didn't know that was commonly observed, I would write down. And then I fleshed out the, the narrative outline, and then it was a matter of the execution, which, once I have those materials put together, is usually rather rapid. And then it sat for a long time, and when I published the book that preceded this, I knew that I was equally confident in this one, and so after I got my confidence in terms of the whole process of the finished product and you know producing the book and promoting it that this would be next and so then I put another maybe six months into making sure that it was absolutely ready to go out and do so it was battle. about two years yeah maybe a two-year process it's not a quick read okay but it's a worthwhile read Thank because you. it reminded me you know when you go out for a tempo run sure or speed run mm -hmm. you want to get it over Mm -hmm. Pretty quickly because it's hard work. Yes. But then you go out for a nature walk. Mm -hmm. And it's a different story because now mm -hmm. you want to hear the birds. Sure. And you want to take in the aromas. You want to, you know, you want your senses working. You want to be able to hear your heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you play music, but probably not because mm -hmm. you're, you're in nature. Mm -hmm. So this book to me is like, oh no, this is not a sprint. Okay. This is going out for a nature walk mm -hmm. where you're taking it leisurely and taking it all in because you don't want to rush through it mm -hmm. because you'll miss stuff. I appreciate <laughs> you saying that. So you're correct. This is more long, slow distance Definitely. than tempo or interval pace. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. But, you know, I'm fascinated. You're, you're a writer, which is also a lot of sitting down. Yes. And you're a pianist, a lot of sitting down. Mm -hmm. So all the sitting down... So how do you make sure, as you know, it's controversial, but, you know, they say sitting is the new cancer. Yes, I've heard this. So, mm -hmm. so do you have a timer that says, get up? <laughs> I guess maybe the blessing of practicing the piano so much when I was younger 
uh, I don't mean anything against my history as a pianist, but taught me to get up frequently because I don't have the drive to practice as I did when I was a teenager and in my 20s. And so when I do practice and when I do write, I get up pretty frequently. So the execution will be in, in quick bursts. Uh, I'm going through a burpee phase right now, you know, squat thrusts, okay. or, you know, as, a, as an alternative exercise. I'll often get up and say after 20 minutes of writing or, oh, or okay. practicing. So you make a conscious decision. To I do and say it's moving. time. Yes, okay. I do. You're a pianist. In fact, I was surprised to learn that you could get a doctorate in piano performance. Mm -hmm. You can. Was that a worthwhile thing to go through? It is if you love the literature of the piano and feel that your love for it is a love that is regardless of a professional gratification because it is a hard life. That led to the book that precedes this, right. That Iron String, which explores the notion that the conservatory world and the piano world is able to produce virtuosos in a number way out of proportion, incredibly out of proportion to the number of prospective places and jobs. I would say maybe there are five, six, ten maybe great virtuosos who we know by name who really ultimately will have a lifetime's longevity doing right, that. Right. And yet the conservatories can pump out the thousands, in the numbers of the thousands of people who can play by a 19th century standard when the great virtuosos first emerged right, right. at a level that would astonish those people. Right, so what, right. would ha what, what happens to all these people? So it was a novel that explored Oh, the iron string. That iron string. What would happen if someone had such a great faith in man, mankind, that despite his diminishing career, he couldn't blame the fickleness of the public. Oh. So he blames the music itself and oh. takes his vengeance out on the literature of the piano. <laughs> but, yes. so you're, you're currently a pianist. Is mm -hmm. that how you earn your living? For the most part. Or caught the books, uh, help yes. a bit. Now, do you perform on Broadway? So I have not played in a Broadway house, but I've played in regional theater uh, quite often as a music director, rehearsal pianist, and play for a lot of concert cabaret settings uh, okay. for Broadway singers. Okay. If somebody wanted to go see you play, where would they go? Cohall Planting Fields in Oyster Bay. I play there quite frequently. Is that a restaurant? No, it is a state park. Oh. Oh, okay. And it maintains one of the last standing intact Gold Coast mansions. It has a beautiful setting, magnificent Steinway piano, and they have a wonderful concert series there, and that's a venue where I play quite often. I wasn't raised in music, mm -hmm. but I loved Victor Borg. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, he, in early history, he was quite a mm -hmm. virtuoso, mm -hmm. but he turned his career into comedy yes. with the piano. When, when you see a Victor Borg and his elements, how does that make you feel? Gratified, because classical music is, is glorious, and yet it has enormous potential for comedy. And I'm amazed that more people don't tap into it like he did. Interesting. And I think the tragic element, now that he has passed, that there's really, I haven't seen anyone to fulfill oh, he was a following guy. place. Yes. And his comedy is also so joyful. It's never, in, in, even when he's parodying what he is making fun of, I never see it as in any way unkind. Uh, it's very joyful. And I think it only serves the music that at times it's even making fun of. Okay. And that note. Yes. Long live Victor Borg. Yes, sir. And that call. Thank you, sir. Will, thank you so much.